Hello and welcome to this third in a series of six films about the standard level kinetics topic. In the first and the second films we looked at what we mean by rates of reaction and how we might measure them. Um, but here in this uh, third film and also in the fourth film we're going to look at two really important theories that allow us to think about why certain factors will affect rates of chemical reactions. And we're going to start off by looking at the collision theory. So hopefully by the end of this film you'll know what the collision theory actually states and you'll have linked your knowledge of the energetics topic which hopefully you've studied by now and you'll link that to this topic the kinetics topic and reason for doing that is so that we can see what activation energy has got to do with rate okay well let's start off by looking at what collision theory actually says collision theory deals with what has to happen in order for a reaction to take place now this diagram here is supposed to show us two sets of particles, the greens and the purples, which could potentially react together and make some new substance. Okay? But this line down the middle is supposed to represent a barrier. And hopefully you can imagine that this barrier is going to prevent a reaction happening. Why is it going to prevent a reaction happening? Well, because there's no way for these two sets of particles to make contact with one another. And I suppose this is the most obvious or maybe easiest to remember part of collision theory it says that in order for two particles to react together they have to be able to collide with one another so hence the name collision theory but as we can see here in this picture some collisions lead to reactions and some don't so in the top part of this diagram in part A we can see two particles an orange and a green one colliding together but then just bouncing away from each other whereas these two particles seem to be reacting together in this flash of reaction excitement and turning into these products okay so why is it that some collisions lead to reactions and some don't well if we now think about energetics and try and link those ideas with rates of reaction then we can maybe remember something about energy level diagrams and here we've got some reactants carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide which are trying or I suppose they're not trying but they have the potential to turn into carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide what's standing in their way well this hump that they've got to get over and we call that hump the activation energy so in other words, these two particles could collide, but unless they've got enough energy to get over that hump, they're never going to form these products, even if these products are more stable than the reactants, in fact. Okay, so that's something we talked about in the energetics films. Okay? Another way of putting this is to say that the reactants will only form products if they've got enough energy in that collision to reach the what is called the activated complex. Now, the activated complex is kind of what exists at the top of this hill. It's kind of a, a, a very fleeting um, moment in time when the reactants bonds are breaking at the same time as the products bonds are forming. So we can kind of think of this activated complex as a kind of cross between the reactants and products. Okay, so two ways of thinking of this. We can either say that the collision will only lead to reaction if there's enough energy to exceed the activation energy or we can say that the collision will only lead to a reaction if it's got enough energy to reach the activated complex and yet still some collisions don't lead to reactions even if they've got enough energy now why could that be well if we look at this picture here we can see that this particle of a is colliding with the bc particle and it's turning into some products A, B and C. But this A particle collides with, these, with this particle and doesn't lead to a reaction. Now this could be true even if that collision had enough energy to exceed the activation energy because if the particles don't collide in the right direction, that is to say their orientation is incorrect, then even if that collision has got enough energy, the reaction can't happen. So now we've kind of covered three things that have to happen in order for two particles to react. So we can put these three things together and we'll end up with what we call the collision theory. So in order for two things to react, the particles first of all have to be able to collide, they have to 
collide with one another with enough energy to exceed the activation energy or to reach the activated complex. But not only do they have to collide with enough energy, they've also got to collide with the correct orientation. And I suppose you could say that the orientation thing isn't all that important in SL. You need to remember it, but it doesn't really come into it all that much. It will be looked at in a little bit more depth when you do the higher level topic and we try and describe rates in terms of an equation. Anyway, hopefully, um, as we aim to do by the at the start of this film, um, you now understand what we mean by collision theory. You can say what it says, three things, and hopefully you've also made a link between the two topics of energetics and kinetics, and you can understand what activation energy has got to do with anything. As usual, if you've got any questions or comments, please come and see me um, or post a comment on YouTube.